their input and they got you know all their people's mic, general assembly, all these things on camera um, broadcast out so that people could actually see what does it look like if we actually did think about lateral government. Um, but anytime you get that narrative out in the public, it's basically throwing down a gauntlet. And a lot of different hierarchical movements, um, you know, sort of then immediately swoop in. So like all your move on and current and the apparatuses of the Democratic Party, you know, see their challenge put before them to come in and see if we can co-opt this thing. And the Tea Party, you know, wants, can we co-opt it back? And, you know, I mean, everybody has seen the gauntlet on the ground of like, oh, you really think you're going to do, you know, respecting everybody and having that? No, you know, <laughs> we can't let that happen. So it just seems to me that there's, um, that thus far there's been sort of seeming success in keeping a sort of a lateral, it's a holding a meeting space where different ideas, even ideas that, you know, you think are crazy, um, they're there, you know, I mean, everybody's ideas, and then, I mean, the only way you can sort of get to a higher place is to put everybody's, you know, ideas in the pot and discuss them and synthesize out something better, you know, I mean, so, thus far, we've sort of been holding that down there, down there. Um, but you definitely see, you know, all the, well, I mean, you know, Move On has a gajillion dollars and a huge email list, and they just sort of say, you know, occupy March on Thursday, and, you know, I mean, so. In our town, they regularly send out the call for the march, and then there's always, uh, it's always at the wrong corners. I don't know why that happens, but the actual Occupy people are always like nearby and nobody goes to the movie. <laughs> again and again, I've seen it, you know? Because I, I think, you know, I, I'm not a big fan of Move On, but I appreciate that there are people who, that is a it is notable reason why they, people why they participate. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, they had an impact on the direction of the country. Yeah. So, um, I want to address the questions that you've posed, and I think you were going to begin to answer them. Is that right? Uh, just to throw out a good beginning for it. Yeah. All, Great. Which is that um, almost immediately, as soon as the word was out about the the raids, on, we hit the street here in Buffalo. On, <coughs> I think probably there are a number of people here who can remember that. Um, and that in itself, that simultaneous with so many other places that held demonstrations at the same time, it's like a warning. It's like a warning. We, we are all here. We're all here together. Everybody in this community who has fought for the rights of oppressed people, of oppressed nations, of uh, the, the um, people like the Fort Dix Five and so on, who have been dragged around by this country and its injustice system. Everybody who has fought for any kind of justice or in any kind of anti-war movement in this town was out there in front of the FBI building. They've seen us all before. They know we're together. And that happened in so many places that it's like putting it on the line. Here we are, and we do have each other's backs. And we'll bring out the rest of the people if we have to. But we can get out here at the drop of a hat, and we bet that you want to know that. I think that was a good message to begin. And it's a good part of what needs to be done. Maybe what were some of the other questions you had? Just into, oh, I think Nate had asked the question about just the different kind of like the different. Oh, how do you unify? How do you unify? Forces? Yeah, different forces. Like you were sort of talking about it in this the convention. I think when I was younger, I was kind of uh, not not as good as it, at it as you know after twenty years of having other people kind of teach me how to figure out how to unify people who don't necessarily want to unify with you. Mm -hmm. You have to create uh, 
uh, motion and situations to make them unify with you. And part of it is, like you said, how do you get people organized? Part of it is being very direct and telling them what you want from them and why you want it. But also, you go, you go out to their allies and friends and tell them, well, I'm trying to get this group or this, you know, it, you know, within the movement, it's different than dealing with, you know, the people we're struggling to force change upon, right? So we try to treat each other well, but, you know, it, it means sometimes you have to go have hard, difficult meetings where you work things out with people and kind of come to agreements, often knowing that those agreements will be broken too, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, like in a survivor kind of way. <laughs> you know, we have this trust, we have this relationship, it's going well. I predict uh, in week three that they are going to ditch us because they are going to get what they want and sell us out, right? So she knows, she's got experience. So I think, you know, it's just kind of, you have to, you know, it's hard to talk a little abstractly about, but, you know, we, we, we can unite people like we did leading up to the Republican National Convention. You know, there are basically four national anti-war groups. Two were kind of bigger than the other two. But, and, you know, and you had kind of other dynamics of why they wouldn't work together that don't have a lot to do with what people, most people see as the movement. But we just worked them individually, talking about how we were uniting the other ones. And sometimes it's persuasion, and sometimes it's maybe exaggerating how much they're participating, so the other ones start to, people like competition, right, or jealousy, and they think, well, if they're doing it, we better get in on it now. And so you build those dynamics, you know. But, you know, on a local level here, I, I'm, I don't know the situation here. So. Tom, Tom, sister. Tom, if I, if I, I might want to call in the oh, sister. Sure. I'm um, sorry. She I'm hasn't sorry. spoken I, yet. I should have asked earlier, it was a little more relevant earlier, but I, there's a, a new book that we have called Conspiracy to Riot in Furtherance of Terrorism. And it's about, um, I think it was the eight, the RNC eight, right? The eight activists who were arrested um, just before the RNC demonstrations and uh, were charged with conspiracy to riot and furtherance of terrorism. And it, it's over there. It's about it's all their personal um, stories and experiences. And I was wondering if right, so it's brand new. Um, so if you guys haven't seen it, check it out. But if, uh, if you could talk about how I mean that was a. Does, uh, they had terrorism enhancements on all the charges they were facing, and they were arrested before anything actually happened, right? So it was the strategy of, you know, what kind of what you were talking about with there weren't really any leaders, but these people were seen as the leaders of whatever kind of demonstrations were going on, um, even though that wasn't, you know, necessarily true. But they figured that if they rounded them up, then it would, you know, stop whatever was going to be going on. So I guess the main thing I'm wondering is if you could just talk about how, what they were facing in terms of charges affects like how, what the group of people that you've been dealing with, what you think about those charges and if it's been affecting your strategy and, um, and you know, your, how you're acting. Um, you, you get the prize of the night. That was what I was trying to remember that I hadn't talked about. Oh, great. <laughs> so you win. I'm sorry. You, you get the red star. Um, I'm not sure I can answer your question, but I did want to talk about them in terms of the unity of the movement. It kind of ties to what you're saying, which is there. there's also, you know, we're building for the RNC protest, and we work with a lot of different ideological groups, a lot of different sectors, you know, um, and there's a lot of layers and complexity and, you know, we have alliances and coalitions within that. And so um, one of the contradictions that seems to come up a lot, and it's coming up still with the Occupy movement, is kind of with pacifist politics 
and I don't want to paint people into corners here, but generally speaking, pacifist politics and anarchist, right? And uh, one of the things we did was we figured out how to unite people in the process of building the coalition for the RNC protest. And there's something that we came out with called the St. Paul Principles, which you can find online, which I think were helpful. And there's also um, now for the NATO G8, there's the Chicago Principles that are kind of those, but I haven't studied what the differences are, but you can find them yourselves. And, you know, a lot of people were saying, you know, within the unity process towards the protest, well, we can't have the anarchists doing the things that they do. And, you know, we're, we kept saying, the anarchists are great. They bring lots of people, they bring life and energy to the movement, and they have uh, a lot of views that the rest of us share, you know? And the anarchists are saying, ah, them pacifists, you know? <laughs> Whatever they say about the pacifists, you know? So we talk to the anarchists and work out how we can unite everybody. And that's where the St. Paul principles made a difference. We said, you know, we just defined like the first day would be a big mass march that everyone can participate in. If people want to do what we call advanced actions, you know, kind of more militant protests, define a time and a space away from the main mass march to then do those things, you know, so that, the, you know, the people who don't want to be part of it aren't forced into a situation they don't, they come away from with negative uh, views about. And the anarchists figured out you know, working together with others, how to, how to accomplish, for the most part, what they wanted to do. So, I, you know, I'm not, I don't know that I can speak for everyone, but I know we feel very close with the anarchists, particularly in Chicago and Minnesota. See, I'm saying close, like, we're, we're like that, you know? And we've known each other for decades, some of us, and we've always defended each other. So that continued into the RNC thing. When the first house got raided, I got a phone call immediately from a young woman I met through the Coca-Cola campaign. You know, and she was she was she was sent to the store to get something by the group, and she just happened to not be in the house when the raid happened. And she called me and said, "What do I do?" You know, and I said, "You walk the other way, yeah. <laughs> get out of there." So. But, you know, we immediately went to help defend them, but we, we also, we didn't have a very good sleep that night because we thought, well, they still have about six hours to raid the houses we're sleeping mm -hmm. on the floors in. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't know, they didn't, and we went ahead with the big protest and tried to help do defense work immediately, you know. And... Um, I would probably, I don't know that much about the legal case, you know, but I do, I can tell you this is we supported them through the legal process, especially in Minnesota, where, you know, there's a big crew of people that were raided and arrested, first the anarchists and then us, you know, mm -hmm. a year later. It was a whole year later, right? Why do you think that there was, I don't mean to interrupt you, but why That's that fine. delay do you think? Well, I think they raided the anarchists in part because they thought they could make a more big media blitz out of it, mm -hmm. you know, and paint kind of the... the mm -hmm. And they thought they were cutting the dragon's head off, right? I mean, they thought they were... Yeah. It was like a strategic move Yeah, I think they, they thought it was strategic and would harm the overall protest. Mm -hmm. Also harm the unity mm -hmm. of the, the coalitions that were built. And then I think it also, they thought it would play well in the media that mm -hmm. we've discovered urine bombs and kind of <laughs> things that didn't exist and weren't real. <laughs> That's what they said, if I remember correctly. And, and it, it was just like a, an attempt to smear the whole campaign and protest. They always do that to the left. And, and that's why the unity we had built with the pacifist was so important, because then they try to go to the pacifist and get quotes saying, well, they're not part of our movement. They're not with us. And we were like, they're absolutely with us. We defend them. They've done nothing wrong. We're going ahead with the protest tomorrow. Be there. We're going to get them out of jail as soon as the protest is over. You know, it probably took us a little longer and, you know, but 
you know, we try to take care of everybody. So I can tell you what the result was, is when they won civil suits with money, they donated the money to us, you know? And I, I, when they called me to tell me they were donating money, I said, you're better people than we are. <laughs> because I, I just couldn't believe, like they'd been through all of this struggle and donated all their time and effort and they turn right around and say, here, we want to help you. Here's the money from our court case, you know. They're incredible people, you know. I get weepy about it. <laughs> so, but I don't, I'm sorry, I don't know the, I didn't follow the court case closely. You know? I, but I mean, does it, like, does it concern you in terms of, I mean, is it, you know, like, in the back of your head, holy crap, in furtherance of terrorism, well, material support for terrorism, you know, they're, yes. you know, they're saying, uh, the I think they're saying, um, I'm oh, getting right. tired, right. I think they were saying 15 year sentences right. for some of us, you know. I know that because I thought it was seven at first, and then, you know, when the lawyers say 15, it gets a little sharper, you know, that, you know, you won't see your kid for, they'll be an adult the next time. But they their terrorism charges were dropped. Right. Yeah. Right. They beat it. Mm -hmm. But there was those two guys from Austin who went went to prison mm -hmm. for a short period, all based the on lack the lack of one of six. Yeah. The lack of one of six. I was hoping someone would bring that up because I, I was reading about that. Mm -hmm. What's the status of their case? Their oh, death. all of them. Went That's what I mean. Yeah. All of them went and to when do they get out? Uh, one of them. So, so. Uh, Maybe we should tour one of them, you know. They assassinated one of them in uh, Yemen or something, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought he was still in prison. He was the No, unindicted co conspirator guy. He would have been the black one of seven. He would have been uh, the only extra. I thought he turned himself back into the Yemen government after he was like, down with the Hellfire missile? No, uh, no they got him with a drone gun. With a drone with a Hellfire oh, missile. Right. Yeah. Through a cell phone. Yeah. Wow. Bam. Anyway, can I, can I, I'm just going to make announcements. Uh, uh, no, no, I just, uh, thanks everyone for coming and we need support here uh, for to bring great minded people together here. And so we have upcoming events and I just want to make those announcements uh, in order of how they're coming. So not next week, well next week we have 2012 Time for Change by Evolver Buffalo, which is a, a group that's going to do a movie. And on the 14th, uh, Leonard Peltier Defense Offense Committee uh, it's going to show the movie John, uh, Trudell, which is a movie about, I'll read very quick. The 2005 documentary traces the life of former American Indian Movement chairman John Trudell and his involvement in the American Indian Movement occupies occupation of Alcatraz Island, 1969, the highly suspicious fire that took the lives of his wife and three children and mother-in-law. And so that will be uh, Wednesday at 7 p.m. Uh, on the 14th, December 14th. Uh, and then the next day, on Thursday, uh, we have... Safaya Bukhari's daughter, coming Wanda um, Jones, who, and Safaya Bukhari was uh, the co-founder of the Jericho Movement, Amnesty for All Political Prisoners, and she wrote a book called The War Before, and uh, Wanda, her daughter, will be coming to talk about uh, Safaya's, like, if, if you know anything about the political prison movement, it was like, basically, you know, this one of these huge movements with all these people for civil rights, for anti-war, and like, a lot of people were taken out of that, targeted, and they've been in jail since the 60s and 70s. And Safaya uh, was in jail for nine years herself. She got out and was just like, we cannot leave our people to be l l raced away. And she's like, just a really warm heart and family and did a lot of good work, church freeing all those people. She passed away recently. Uh, and the last one is uh, the first annual Burn Books Winter Open House and Grand Opening Party, which will be the last day we'll have uh, Ten percent off store wide food and drinks. Uh, support burning books in your local freedom struggle. Get involved. Uh, get your loved ones revolutionary holiday gifts. Uh, so yeah, I'm gonna. That's, the, that's Friday the 16th. So those those three events are boom boom boom. You see all the red um, on the calendar, and I'm gonna pass these out. And if you guys don't want them yourself, please pass them off to somebody else and help. You know. If, help promote this because this type of conversation, you know, we don't have the answers. No one has all the answers, but if we get together, we get some people power, we get some results.
And also, thank you so much for Tom. That's, I think we should all give Tom a big round of applause. seen the left one was much bigger than it is today and um, but I, I never felt that there was a whole lot of cooperation in, in, in this city and that's bothered me a, a lot over the last 10 or 20 years so um, there used to be a saying around the left of unite all who can be united and I think you can do it on a number of levels right um, and, I, and I don't think that there's necessarily a contradiction between working on behalf of a progressive politician or a progressive cause, and, and also um, building a movement in the, in the streets. Um, I regard elections as tactics. And, and that's why I said before, I don't think it's an either or question. Um, and just over the last couple of months, I, I'd just like to share a couple of things with people. The Coalition for Economic Justice that I'm, I'm a member of, they held a, their quarterly meeting, and they invited people from Occupy Buffalo to come to it. And it exposed about 30 or 40 people who would otherwise not have been exposed to Occupy Buffalo. And I heard um, one of the people who was very prominent down there, and within a week he was speaking to our Buffalo AFL-CIO. I was still a delegate to the Buffalo AFL-CIO Council. And on the way over there, I thought, what's one thing that we can do for, for the people besides applauding for them when they speak at our meeting. Of course, they need money. You know, so I went up to the treasurer before the meeting and I said, can we afford 250 for these guys? And somebody came up and said, we can double that. So it was all worked out before the meeting was held. Um, we started, who was gonna make the motion, who was gonna second my motion, and just like that, like $500 that they wouldn't have, have had. Um, about two years ago, I helped put together this um, program in Buffalo. Native, if I had known you then, I would have invited you to it. And it was basically to try to wake people up in the Buffalo area to the dangers of the Tea Party. Now, you have to work very hard in order to, when you're building an area-wide event, you have no idea how many people are going to come. It's like we had no idea how many people were going to come tonight. But I worked on it for three months and got the NAACP involved, and working with the Family Party, Buffalo, AFL, CIO. We had about 150 people show up at it, you know, which really wow. re exceeded my um, expectations. Good. So none of these things necessarily, it's not that like one does, that builds on the other. I mean, we like things that, to work that way if possible. But I think whenever you're educating and mobilizing and getting people in action, you're, you're making progress. And I'm impressed with the, not only this bookstore that you put together and the wonderful programs that you've had down here, but the work that you're doing on this fracking issue. Because I know you've been involved in that. And I know people in Buffalo that are involved in um, the Clean Air Coalition. And if, if, if there are people in the room that aren't aware of them, they're doing some terrific work in the, in the city. Um, they were the only people in Buffalo that reached out to those poor people in the neighborhoods and we had those fires here in the summer, and they evacuated the kids over at Buffalo State no, and, and didn't tell anybody to evacuate, evacuate the neighborhoods, you know, where, the, where old people and, and children were out playing that day. You know? So a lot of these organizations don't necessarily work together, but I think more and more people are getting aware of the need to do so. And I'll just close by saying um, that there are people in the Peace Center that agree with this. and. Um, they had a notice on their website. They sent out a weekly notification to people about all the progressive events that are going on in Buffalo. And this was one of them. You know, so I mean, I don't, I don't know how many people are here because they saw that. The Peace Center put fifty dollars to support this event. Okay, all right. But I mean, that, that was a good thing, you know, for whatever reason they did it. Um, and and, um, and, I, and I'm glad to hear that they threw some money to mm -hmm. um, to the event tonight. So these are all, like, in my estimation, very positive things. Uh, the, the more we can work together and focus on what we have in common yes. and to minimize the differences, I think we're all going to be better off for it. Right on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Yeah. I think like maybe we can use more events to get all these groups together and like advertise to any event. You know, I don't know who could do that. The peace center. Yeah. The peace center is a good idea. Well, I appreciate y'all coming and I like learning from you as well. So hopefully uh, if Carlos Montes is on trial, you'll remember and I'll be I'll be contacting you personally to ask directly <laughs> that you hold a protest and then uh, in May in Chicago um, you know the NATO G8 event opens on the 15th that's why there's a date for a protest then because we want to announce to the world that the people of this country are not happy with the war and poverty agenda and then on the 19th is the Saturday which is the more likely day that you all would travel to Chicago to come on the Saturday <laughs> protest, and it will probably be much bigger, and that's when the NATO G8 summit ends. But, uh, you know, we might stop another war or two, you know, honestly, you know, and it will help us in the long run. So, thanks again, for it. So you going down to Occupy? You gonna check us out? Well, if we have time, I would like to. Oh, you got it. I'm leaving at eight in the morning.